Bill, Bill was responsible for strategic direction and execution of Aprima's national marketing initiatives, sales teams, client, customer services, and uh, product management, serving 350 reseller channels. Under Bill's leadership, Aprima captured a 65% market share for mobile acquiring products, he opened new markets in cash spending and smartphone-based mobile acquiring by signing the four, uh, Fortune 100 partners. Prior to Apriva, Bill served as general manager of wireless products, director of emerging technology, and first aid emerging services, and first aid resources. During his 17-year ten uh, tenure there, he pioneered the delivery of sales of emerging technologies over a wide range of markets, including internet banking, electronic bill presentment, web-based emerging services, RFID slash NFC, and the release of TCP slash IP and 3G wireless acquiring products. Please welcome Bill. By the way, we did send a shorter one, but it apparently didn't get there. <laughs> what, uh, what that bio doesn't say is all the things we've done for the last three years now uh, at Spindle. Uh, we've rolled up uh, four companies, uh, some of which we'll talk about, and uh, really pushing hard. Uh, the panel earlier uh, talked about all the things that are wrong, all the things that could happen, and I kind of have a, a basic philosophy, and that's because mobile isn't really here yet. We're not using mobile. Uh, to, its, to its fullest extent. Also, doing this uh, kind of thing many times, uh, I sometimes get told, gosh, the print on your slides are too small. So today I took a different approach. Today we're going to do pictures. Just pictures. A couple words, but mostly pictures. And, uh, and I did this as a way of kind of setting the stage for all the things we'll see in the next couple of days, all the great things that are coming. Uh, and certainly one of the things that we're working on that we'll have at our booth, which will be towards the end. But as we kind of get into this, a little bit of fun, uh, a little history, if you will. I have enough gray hair that have lived through most of what's in this slide. Others in the room have, and, and others probably haven't yet, but uh, hopefully this will be entertaining. Afterwards, if you like it, great, let me know. If you didn't, let me know, and I won't do it again. So anyway, with that, first thing, uh, maybe the base uh, a proposition here is that really the value of mobile lies in changing uh, the way we interact with customers, the way we do business, the way things uh, happen, not just putting plastic card information into a phone and transacting, but actually changing the nature of what we do. That was the earliest wireless phones. We called them cordless back in the day, but at the end of the day, it was just between the handset and the base unit. Then came the true wireless, where we were actually able to connect between the phone and the network. And I actually remember some of the first ones. They were bag phones that literally were, were five or six pounds to carry around. But of course, things have evolved. And we now have a very slick, very efficient, very usable device iPhones, I put the Samsung up there. I happen to be a, a Samsung fan, a Galaxy fan. Uh, so you already know where I stand on, on the war of Apple versus Android, I guess. Although, as a product guy, uh, we support both and we will continue to. And in fact, we'll also probably support Microsoft uh, pretty quickly here as that platform begins to, uh, to take off a little bit more. And then who knows what's next? Who knows what happens in a couple of years? Who knows who wins? And, and uh, you'll see a couple of those slides as well, which kind of indicate. Uh, that ongoing technology war. Uh, the old. Anybody know what the one on the left is? Lisa. That is an old Zenith Z100 kit that you put together. I, uh, I was at uh, the TMC show connected with these guys here uh, uh, over the summer, and uh, Wozniak was there, the, the Apple, one of the Apple founders, and he was talking about how they got started, the kits, how things work. And somebody said to Steve Jobs, gosh, wouldn't it be great if you guys could just put it together for us? We don't want to have to put it together. And Apple was born, at least Apple in the mainstream that we know it today. Just interesting how those little questions, those opportunities come up and, uh, and how we react as a business. So I skipped a 
maybe a whole step. But I would make the proposition that this is the new computer, right? Certainly with some of the, uh, the new tablets that, that Microsoft have, the merger of, uh, of uh, I guess, tablet capability and PC capability with, uh, with uh, Windows 8, we're soon gonna go past the old form factors. In fact, those same form factors are being impacted today in our merchant business and, and uh, the kinds of services we deliver, the kinds of equipment we sell, and I'll have a few slides on that here shortly as well. So the old 10-inch floppy disks on the left, and yes, when you used to buy an old PC, you, it would come with a three and a half disk or a five and a half disk, but if you really wanted storage, you needed to go and buy a drive that took the older style big floppies and, uh, and connect that. And on the right, that's the storage, that's your archive. That was, that was maybe cloud storage as we know it today. Uh, you, uh, you would put your disks all nicely numbered. I remember getting Windows, and I think there would be like 16 disks that you'd get just below the operating system. So the new, on the left, 64 gigabyte thumb drive. In many cases, what did they cost? 99 bucks. That was for, uh, probably more memory there than an entire room of floppy disks. And then Google Drive is really endless. You can put almost anything you're willing to pay for out in the cloud. And being a technologist back in the day, and actually we still do this, data centers, cabling, I can remember some of my three days having to make some changes or upgrades. We'd send guys down to the data center. They'd have to go search all the wires, figure out everything, kind of figure out what needed to happen. There'd be an upgrade schedule. We'd have a rollout. Spindle today logs in and makes changes. We do everything in Amazon on the cloud. I have an IT department of one. And we run multiple regions. We have redundant servers. We have everything backed up. So the cloud really has changed things. Now, interestingly enough, what Amazon is doing is very much like we did back in the day with Timeshare. So just a great big data center that's been, uh, had some software laid over it to make it easy to get to. So all of these things are getting to a point. I got a couple more slides. And then we're gonna talk about what mobile can do to make the change uh, for us uh, really uh, at the point of sale. So the old, and actually this isn't really that old. This is still stuff we sell. But the point of the one on the right is, is that's an IBM PC-based platform. And the new, a little dongle that plugs into your phone, you run an app, or you run an app on your iPad, and the one on the right is the NCR Silver platform. Uh, you uh, download what you need, purchase the equipment, you're off and running. Again, uh, the evolution of technology really makes things a lot easier. So the point of the presentation, and uh, really, I guess the point of the whole show, is what is coming? What does mobile do to change the way we interact, the way we transact business, the way, uh, way, the way we will do things in the future? Because simply taking and putting the old way into a phone and using it the old way isn't really the promise of mobile in my mind. I think mobile has an opportunity to really change things uh, very dramatically. So here's a line, a queue, and we heard a little bit on the panel earlier about some of these opportunities. But what if I didn't have to go stand in that line? What if I could walk up to a garment or shop or any kind of item in the store? And certainly Beacon Technology plays a part in this if the store desires to have it. I could scan a tag or actually receive a push notification with product information questions and answers. Maybe if I, uh, one of the, the issues in showrooming, uh, if you guys are familiar with that, uh, Best Buy is always an example, <clears throat> excuse me, that I use. I go to Best Buy, I look at the router, I touch the equipment, I ask questions, then I scan the barcode and I buy on Amazon. What if, uh, what if Best Buy could get in the middle of that? What if Best Buy could offer you a similar price, have the thing delivered at your door the same way Amazon did? What if you had other questions? What if Amazon could say, by the way, if you buy it now, we'll give you 25% discount on the cables that go with that. That only happens when the store and the, and the people that are, uh, I guess, uh, prepared to make these offers know where you're at, know what's going on, know what you're looking at, and I think the technology today is available to do that. 
scan the tag after you've decided to purchase, pick your payment type, purchase is complete, and you walk to the VIP li uh, line to have the garment tags removed, and you are done. Transaction complete. Those kinds of tags give you an opportunity to do other things. Now we can do it in the store window after hours. We can do things in printed media. You can see the, the uh, tag on the lower left corner. We can do things on TV. At the end of the day, proposition is, is that mobile turns your phone, you, into the point of sale. Can we do all of that today? No. There are certainly a lot of technology that has to happen. There's an implied connection between the phone and the shopping experience and the point of sale systems inside the stores. Obviously the payment piece, which we're here to talk about, uh, is, is probably pretty easy to do and we'll actually have some of these demos in the booth. But this isn't mainstream and along with this comes a lot of extra work. This, there's uh, the marketing component of it. Uh, there is the, uh, the security component, the authentication components. A lot of things have to come together. But that I think is the real promise of all. How do we do something different than what we're already doing today? How do we make that process easier, more engaging, uh, and better for both the merchant and the consumer? So here's my commercial. Uh, these are two of the companies that we acquired. Uh, we did for the V Network side and in cooperation with some of the IT Expo side. We have merchants in the area that have special promotions, so if you want to download the app, uh, those promotions are available in the South Beach area. Uh, Yowza is a, uh, a couponing platform that we just actually acquired about three weeks ago, and we'll be merging those together over some time. So now as a company, we have the content, we have the technology, we're a payment service provider, we're an aggregator, uh, and we're now able to do those payment processing behind the scenes to make the proposition of the point of sale, the personal point of sale, real. So the whole point is we need to move from just a transaction to a full interaction where the consumer and the merchant and their shopping experience are engaged in a single, a single type of, it, uh, of an exercise. So that is the presentation. Um, I thought maybe we could do some questions and answers. There's not a lot here. I didn't want to give you a sales pitch. I didn't want to give you a slide with a lot of writing that we would have to kind of read to you. Uh, so questions, comments? Yes. Hi, Bill. Um, I'm just wondering, are you doing anything with video? Uh, video as in using video to sell things? Yes. Um, we, uh, some of our advertisers are, okay. yes. And in, in those videos, depending on how they're presented, you could certainly have uh, an icon or a tag, a human interfaceable tag rather than a barcode <coughs> or a QR code that are machine readable and, uh, and could uh, drive purchases based on that. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yes. When you um, do anything more payment, uh, get the card over the PCI. Yes. I am PCI service provider level one certified in the cloud. Lifted mobile payment. Uh, absolutely. And everything's encrypted. Yes. And actually, you know, if you think about it, and one of the propositions, and uh, will be, uh, there's a, a thought leadership article that will be out sooner uh, in the next few days. You know, there's been a lot of stuff on breaches. There's uh, a few more coming, as I understand it. Uh, must be uh, time to confess your sins right now, uh, I guess. Maybe beginning of the year, get out the old and start anew. Uh, but uh, what's wrong with the process? The process is broken because at the end of the day, we don't authenticate. I checked in my hotel last night. They took a copy of my driver's <coughs> license and my credit card on the same piece of paper. And I said, well, gee, what are you going to do with that? Now, the credit card information is probably not that much, but I'm more worried about my driver's license information uh, being, being uh, in their archives. Uh, the guy had no idea why he was doing it. He was just told he needed to do it. I asked him what the uh, if he knew how to uh, the the real authentication of comparing signatures, and they had no clue. So, so our biggest issue really is is that the old way doesn't really work too well. There's no way to enforce it. There's no good education. But using a mobile platform, and this is some of what the panel guys said as well, really does give us an opportunity to do card holder authentication rather than card authentication, which is the promise of EMV and some of the others. And it transcends any particular payment type. It now allows me to know who I'm, uh, is buying from me as a merchant, who I'm selling to, and as a merchant or as a consumer, to have a trusted connection and know that that merchant is not receiving payment data, 
because we do it on the back end in the cloud based on stored information. Card present versus card not present. Pricing difference is predominantly a risk issue, right? One is more risky than the other, so the price is higher. I think that there's opportunities for those kinds of metrics to change as well. And then certainly there's other payment types. Bitcoins is a good example. For us that are actually in the payments business, Bitcoins is not good. But my, uh, my SEC attorneys that uh, support the company, a company called Richardson Patel, just did an announcement that they accept Bitcoins. So I thought, well, that was kind of odd. Well, they do a lot of international work, and they thought that that was a clever way of attracting business. So I said, great. Anyway, other questions, comments? Yes? Uh, are you doing anything with e-commerce and online payments on the mobile space? Absolutely. So the question was, are we doing anything with e-commerce? Uh, any kind of purchases we can support. Uh, certainly the idea with the magazines and whatnot would be more of an e-commerce type purchase. Uh, and we do that. Uh, we process for e-commerce today through our uh, payment service provider uh, uh, program, as well as uh, uh, through uh, some shopping cart partners that we have. So we are. And actually e-commerce is probably the very first place to make the best impact, I think, on, on reducing fraud and identity. Probably the easiest, right? One of the big problems we have collectively, and for all of us that are insiders on the payment side, is, is that the point of sale doesn't take a payment, a mobile payment, right? That is the problem. That's why you see things like loop and all these different audio techniques. Everybody's trying to get around the, this inherent legacy problem of the point of sale. However, there seems to be a pretty significant trend moving towards SaaS-based point of sale, and that by itself uh, accelerates the shift to a more open platform. So we'll see how that happens, or what happens, or how quickly it happens. But I think the promise is there. Evolution is certainly on its way. And uh, unlike the internet, uh, well, I think the trend is very similar. But unlike the internet, this one seems to be going a little quicker. Uh, maybe that's good for the guys that are providing services. Some will win, and some will won't, or some won't. Anyway, questions? More questions? How are we doing on time? Well, we get about 10 minutes. I'm, right. I'm just filled. Oh. Yes. You talk about Bitcoin being bad. Yes. Why do you? Why do you? Say well, I'm not saying. Just my curiosity. Is, I'm just yeah. curious. I'm not saying Bitcoin is bad. I'm saying that I can't accept it as a payment processor today. I don't think the uh, the Justice Department has come out. And in fact, I think there's an awful lot of uh, countries. I was just reading, and I think it was Wall Street Journal here about a week ago, of all the countries that are now putting their names on the list that don't want Bitcoins. You know, at the end of the day, the problem is, is that it just makes it easier for black market. It makes it easier to, to have transactions that are out of purview. It makes it harder for governments to manage money supply. I, I don't have that problem. I don't manage money supply. Uh, at one point early in our spindle uh, history, we considered taking Bitcoins, but that's when, uh, when the price was going down and, and all of the hacking was going on. And at that point, we kind of backed off. So our bank partner is Bank of America Merchant Services, and if they don't like certain things, we don't do them. It's pretty easy. <laughs> Other questions? Sure. Yes. Um, Bill, can you chat with us a little bit about your distribution model? You know, how, how, we, get, how we would get engaged with you? Uh, yes, well today, uh, we have about two million consumers that have uh, downloaded our apps. We have about 95,000 merchant outlets that the, uh, the products are in. Uh, we have a number of merchants uh, that are on the platform as well. Now we're beginning to cross those uh, capabilities. Uh, we have a channel sales model. Uh, we can do some white label branding, uh, and we do some direct sales to merchants as well. So, you know, the, the world of mobile is still uh, new, and this is, again, what the panel said earlier for merchants. Merchants don't understand why they should do it. Merchants still don't understand, in some cases, why they should even put out a coupon or why they should put out an offer. And yet uh, some of them are, are really having troubles with business because no one can find them. Uh, the founder of the Me Network actually started this because he went around the corner down the side street and found the merchant and said, gosh, how does this merchant let anybody know they're around? And hence a mobile platform was, was born. Uh, so, uh, so from a distribution standpoint, uh, we're trying a number of things. Certainly uh, it, it takes a lot of partners. Uh, technology partners, sales partners to, to make these things happen. And as we said earlier, I don't think uh, the market is fully developed the mobile concept yet. And I think there's still some opportunity to, uh, to, to learn and uh, do products and services. And uh, earlier too, I looked at the agenda. I think there's a lot of very good topics yet today that kind of address these very things. The struggle on how you 
getting the products out, how you get mainstream information out, how we make money at it, and, uh, and how do we convince uh, merchants and consumers that this is something good. In my mind, if there's a great offer, if I can get 30% off of something, I might not care where it came from or how I got it or that it got pushed to me on a mobile phone. In fact, I might appreciate that. And what about social media? How are you uh, using social media? Well, I think social media, uh, just for mobile in general, is real important. Uh, we're plugged into it. I think most solutions anymore use social media through connections. The question is, is, is social media now beginning to evolve a bit? And uh, I had heard uh, some information recently as well that uh, a lot of the youngest generation no longer use Facebook or not as much as, as they used to. And there's another wave of social media coming. So, you know, it's just a, com uh, a communications medium. Uh, as is everything. Uh, SMS seems to be kind of going down a bit. Other ways are coming up. Apps are certainly out there, but apps are probably not the end uh, position we'll be in. Apps will probably kind of go away uh, as, a, as an entity or as a component and now be more of an XML5 based interactive type of process. Um, we'll see how that goes as well. Technology is relentless, that's a given. <laughs> so things will change. But I think social media is important. Uh, you know, if I'm a merchant, and certainly on the, on the platforms that we have as we put out ads, uh, we put them out on every channel. We do card linked offers, we do social media, we do Twitter, anywhere the merchant wants that information to go, we provide a venue for that to, to, to be output. As well as on the consumer side, we take in uh, offers and coupons from affiliate networks and other different places as well, so that we're providing value to the consumer. So it is really a consumer and a merchant opportunity that we're all looking at. That's what we're all here for. Mobile payments, the point is, is that you're paying for something, somebody is selling something, somebody is getting paid for it. Uh, and uh, really, it has to be more than a compartmentalized transaction, a swipe of a card, an interaction. It now has to be a full-scale, uh, I guess, dialogue or engagement with the consumer. Questions? Oh, sorry. Yes. This week, I think T-Mobile came out talking about they did. how they're going to have the uh, payments. I think it's assisted through uh, on ISIS wallet maybe through mobile payments. But how do you see them coming in as a stakeholder? How will that change uh, the way they go to wireless carriers or how that will affect the Well, so from a payment standpoint, what I saw initially is T-Mobile putting their name on a, on a prepaid or, or some type of a credit card product. Uh, so that means a couple things. It means that they've got some uh, interchange income potentially. Uh, it also means that they have a potential place to put funds in order to allow funds to be used to be spent. You know, early on the idea of wallets was if we'd all create a prepaid account of some type, uh, we'd load funds on that and we'd go out and use that to buy things. Well, with the payment networks and the things that the way they are today, you don't have to do that. You can pull money uh, through electronic checks or through ACH transactions, which are obviously a little more risky. Uh, certainly through, uh, uh, through the debit networks, you don't necessarily have to, uh, to put fu uh, funds on to a card. Now, in certain fringe areas, like perhaps some of the marijuana sales that are now taking off in some of the states that have legalized it, those things are probably still necessary, uh, but they're not probably the mainstream way of doing it. Uh, personally, I think T-Mobile is uh, uh, making, taking steps towards the inevitability that, uh, that mobile and payments and, and offers and coupons and, and interactions are all mobile. And uh, you know, I, uh, I, I've witnessed a reluctance of some of these bigger companies to really get into the risk model uh, and actually take risk. Uh, and so I guess we'll see. I think that that's uh, part of what's uh, slowed down some of the, the US-based telcos. Where over in Europe, they actually became, I think it was in, is it Japan or one in Korea, where the telco is actually in some cases the bank, right? So those kinds of things, uh, those business decisions uh, will shape really what we do. Uh, or companies like Spindle will come in behind them and provide some technology or a service or something to, to help them uh, manage those issues. Yes? I was in the EMV training yesterday and explained the transaction and how it works. And it's a it's main statement that the U.S. trying to go straight to mobile payments. Yeah, absolutely. Migrating to the EMV. Spindle's trying to get you to go straight to mobile payments. <laughs> as, as is a lot of folks. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <coughs> Well, so let's talk about the point of EMV. EMV in Europe was created because most payments were offline, and this was a way of securing those offline payments. In the U.S., most payments are online, have been for years and years, and at fractions of a penny of cost for doing those transactions, right? 
That doesn't mean the merchants pay fractions of pennies, but the processing costs are very, very low. So if by doing that, you have a lower fraud rate, the question is, is, is the billions of dollars it takes to change the point of sale to support EMV worth the benefit of reducing fraud? I don't know. But I would make a proposition that if I use the right kind of authentication through a mobile phone, I can guarantee the merchant against fraud. And as the merchant of record in a PSP, I have an option whether to accept or not accept EMV. So it'll be interesting to see how that proposition happens and how well companies like us are prepared to stand behind that and guarantee emergent against fraudulent transactions through the right kind of authentication. Uh, but we're not the only ones thinking about it, and I do believe that it's coming. If that happens first, EMV has a lesser chance of uh, getting traction. Uh, although at the same time, there are potentially uh, new ways to drive adoption of things or change the point of sale, which would make EMV easier, actually. Some of these new SaaS-based point of sale have EMV capability. They don't have to be retrofitted in all cases. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know from our standpoint we care, but uh, uh, it's not our, our main thrust. Yes? This is sort of So the question was related to EMV, the idea of secure elements as a way of authenticating. You know, uh, the secure element, as I typically think of it, I equate the secure element in EMV, right, mostly. And uh, my personal uh, dislike for things that are stored on the phone, like card data, in, even in a secure element, is, is that I'm still doing the old process of giving my credit card information or my payment data to a merchant. If we can do something where the merchant and the consumer have an identity and all of the transaction processing is done in the cloud, then there's no risk of the phone being compromised or the merchant being compromised, and hence Target would have never happened. Right? Secure element although, from a technology standpoint, may represent a way for us to do a better job of authenticating because that would certainly be one of the things as a supplier of services we want to make sure is, is that we knew for a fact that Bill had Bill's done making a purchase, right? So there uh, certainly could be some utility in there. And we have some techniques we use, not necessarily on the secure element, but there are certainly ways. Apple with their uh, biometric capabilities now, those things are coming, and secure element may, may provide some value. But it isn't everyone. Okay, okay well, uh, okay. am I done? Yeah, yeah stop well, talking. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys very much. I tried to make this uh, a very light opportunity. Uh, this way you guys can think about all the things we just talked about and what's coming uh, today and, and this week. And uh, by all means, stop by and see us in the booth. Thank you very much. Thank you.